in this lecture, we're going to answer the question, what is a data inventory? And we're going to do that by looking at a handful of concepts. We're first going to look at the DKIW pyramid. We're then going to look at a number of different data terms that are important to understand. We're going to look at data inventory, classification, data flow diagrams, and finally, data accountability. The DIKW pyramid stands for data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Data we can understand as raw facts. Information is aggregated facts that demonstrate a pattern or trend. Knowledge is the use of information to do things. And wisdom is the application of knowledge and experience to make good decisions or judgments. And we can see here that data is the basis for everything that moves up. It's the basis for information, for knowledge, and for wisdom. There are a few terms that we need to understand for the CIPP US. These include data inventory, data controller, and data processor. A data inventory tells us the who, what, where, when, why, and how of our organization's data. A data controller is an individual or an organization that determines the process and means of processing. And a data processor is someone who processes data at the request of the controller. So for example, to process a financial transaction or to fulfill an order at a fulfillment center or shipping. Let me give you an example of what this might actually look like in the real world. I need to have my taxes done by mid-April every year. I'm horrible with numbers. I couldn't use a calculator to save my life. And so instead of trying to do it all on my own and then being audited by the IRS, because again, I'm no good at this kind of stuff, I take all of my financial documents, my tax documents, and I go over to an accountant. I give him all of my paperwork, my data. He processes that data for me. He files my tax return on my behalf and voila, I'm done. And so in this case, I am the data controller it's my data, I control who gets access to it, how it's used, etc. The accountant in this analogy is the data processor. He or she is processing the data at my request on my behalf. Three other important terms are data classification, data flow diagram, and data accountability. Data classification is where we determine the data's sensitivity. We've already talked a few times about data sensitivity one data element that would not be very sensitive would be first and last name, for example, perhaps phone number or email address. On the other hand, some very sensitive information might include our bank account, our financial account numbers, credit card, debit card numbers, the, the addresses, phone numbers, the, the, the CVCs all tied to that financial data. That would all be very sensitive. Similarly, medical information. If we have a medical condition that we would find embarrassing or that perhaps might lead to discrimination, then having that information out there in the wild where anyone could find it would be a problem. And so that's sensitive data. We're gonna look at an example of a data flow diagram in just a few slides. For right now, it's just important to know that this is a tool that maps out how data flows through a system, application, or organization. Finally, data accountability is a party responsible for the data and complying with data ownership requirements. For example, this individual is accountable for the protection, for the retention, for granting access and amendment requests. We mentioned earlier that the data inventory tells us the who, what, where, when, and why for data. And it's important to understand that when we're talking about data inventory, we're not talking about the data on just our customers. We're also talking about the data that we have on our own employees and on our vendors. And so let's say that I'm, a, I'm an e-commerce website and I sell widgets. Well, I sell widgets to people, to my customers. I have my employees who help me to produce widgets. And then I have vendors that provide me with different services. Again, let's just think about the accountant that does all of the, the widget accounting, all right? And so in that case, the, the information on my customers is important, on my employees is important, and on the accountant is also very important. So a, a data inventory is going to account for all of that. 
For this in the next slide, we're going to dive into that idea just a little bit more deeply. Whose data do we have? Who do we share it with? Is it shared domestically or international? And who determines the laws, regulations, and standards that apply to that data? What specific data do we have? And where is that data stored? Is it on a central server? Is it on employee laptops? Is it on a cloud? Is it, is it local in my building? And where is that data processed? When is the data collected? When is it shared? When is it disposed of? Why do we collect the data? And how do we collect the data? How is it protected? How do data subjects opt in and out of collection? And how do data subjects request access, amendment, and deletion? And just to be clear, because I don't think it's come up yet, data subject is a term of art. It refers to the individual from whom we are collecting data. And so, for example, just to go back to my, my widget making company, if I sell a widget to Billy Joe, and in addition to collecting Billy Joe's name and phone number and shipping address, I'm also collecting how often she's visiting my website and at what times, what products she's looking at. In this case, Billy Joe is the data subject. A few important things to consider with regards to data inventory. Making a data inventory is an iterative process, which means it's not one and done. You don't create the inventory and then you never look at it again. This is something that you're constantly revising throughout time. Privacy must have a close relationship with all business functions and learn about their data collection, use, processing, maintenance, storage, etc. processes. Now here, when I'm talking about other business functions, I want you to think about all of the different offices that might exist in an organization. You're gonna have a privacy office, you might have a legal office, an accounting office, a human resources office, a cybersecurity or IT office. These are all different business functions and everyone throughout the organization is using data. Not everyone may have PII or personal information, but everyone's using data. And so when we locate a system that is processing PII, it's important that we understand how that data flows through the organization, which business functions are working with it, what applications they're using to process that data, etc. When we're talking about data classification, we're talking about determining the data's sensitivity. And there are a few different categories or really buckets that we'll use to classify data. One bucket would be low, moderate, high. Again, low sensitivity, moderate sensitivity, high sensitivity. Another bucket of categorization would be one we might find in the federal government. For example, is this data secret? Is it top secret? Is it top secret sensitive compartmented information or TSSCI? Finally, you may see data labeled as public, private, confidential, restricted, or proprietary. And the examples of classification, I used this one before. Again, name, phone number, email would be low, SSN, bank account, medical records, that would be highly sensitive. Once we've determined the classification of the data, then we can determine a few other things. For example, access controls. Who has access to this data? We can determine baseline cybersecurity controls. For example, are we going to encrypt it? Are we going to keep this data on a separate network? Do we need a firewall, access logs, etc.? And the general rule of thumb is that the higher the sensitivity, the more protections are required. Remember, think back to the course introduction. Remember, context matters. Let's say I have a list of names and nothing else. Is that sensitive? Probably not. Let's say I have a list of names and they're found in a folder titled Poor Performance Evaluations. Is that sensitive? Well, it seems a little sensitive because the, the location of the list of names would lead me to think that these are all poor performers. Now think of that same list of names that are found leaked online along with other data tied to the Ashley Madison website. This was an actual breach that happened many years ago. Ashley Madison is a website where married individuals look for an affair. Let's just imagine that this information is leaked online as it was many years ago. There's a list of names there. The indication then is that these are all a bunch of adulterers. Again, context matters. This is an example of a data flow diagram, a very poor one, 
The main takeaway here is that a data flow diagram is a visual representation of how data flows through an organization, how it flows through a particular system. And this is an example of an e-commerce website. We have a, a customer who searches for items, gets uh, queries returned from a product database, views different items, updates the shopping cart, purchases the items, purchases the item, schedules the delivery, logs the delivery, and then gets the package. You don't need to draw a data flow diagram for the CIP PUS, and I think it's very unlikely that you would have to uh, identify one. That's just my conjecture, but you need to know what a data flow diagram is, and you need to understand the, the general concept here. Data accountability answers the questions, who is responsible for the data, and what are the specific responsibilities? There are a handful of questions that you're gonna to wanna to ask. These include regarding data storage, where is the data stored, how is it stored there, and for how long is this data retained? What is the classification and sensitivity? How and where will data be transferred? Will it be transferred internationally? What laws or regulations apply to the data? What requirements are derived from these laws or regulations? How is the data processed? And how does the data flow through the organization? What are the different systems that are involved? In this lecture, we discussed data inventory. We started by looking at the data information knowledge wisdom pyramid. We then went over a handful of terms, including data inventory, data controller, data processor, data classification, data flow diagram, and data accountability. When it comes to data inventory, remember we need to know the who, what, when, where, why, and how. With regards to data classification, know that there are a few different classification models. These include low, moderate, high, secret, top secret, and top secret SCI, and public, private, restricted, confidential, and proprietary. We looked at a messy example of a data flow diagram. You need to remember that a data flow diagram, or DFD, is a visual representation used to understand how data flows through a system. And finally, data accountability. Who is responsible for the data and what are their responsibilities?